there's so much news in rise of kingdoms that we're going to cover in this video first of all the official smite talents have been revealed i'm sure you've seen this in other youtuber videos but i'm going to give you guys my thoughts and opinions on everything then we're going to go over the proposed changes to immigration and the rules surrounding that especially for new players and then later in the video we're going to cover changes to armaments we have a lot to cover today so i'm going to jump right into it but first what's going on guys cheers the first thing i want to go over here is the smite talent tree that was revealed by ihara that's another rise of kingdoms youtuber that i typically shout out on the channel i'll try to remember to link them down below but they revealed everything in the smite tree as far as i can tell except for this talent i think they just skipped over it because it's like just generic stats if they did cover it and i just missed it or if you guys know exactly what this talent is let me know in the comment section below but honestly this singular talent is not going to make or break my judgment of the entire talent tree because they did say it was just stats so it's either attack defense or health small chance it's march speed but i don't think it is anyway i took the information from that video i translated it and then i also put it into photoshop in a way that i think is a little bit easier to understand a lot of other content creators have had like these big blocks of like black covering like Chinese text and stuff I don't know I took a little bit of extra time to just make my own it's just a lot easier for me to look at all at once and if you appreciate that extra effort make sure you drop a thumbs up on the video because it really helps out the channel it's on and consider subscribing you might think that you're subscribed when you're actually not so just double check down there okay now I'm not going to cover all the little bonus stats here because those are kind of irrelevant but I will point out that there is only six percent of March speed from what I can tell in this talent tree which is unfortunate but I'm pretty sure that that is standard at least for the attack talent tree the defense talent tree and I think the skill tree has it as well I'm pretty sure six percent March speed is standard for the blue talent trees if I'm wrong about that please let me know in the comment section below but now that we know the rest of the talents we could take a look at some of these specifics here so for example this one looks like it gives you nine rage for each basic attack that you deal here we get plus three percent smite damage here we get plus three percent counter attack damage here we get six percent bonus smite damage for six seconds after dealing smite damage and then up here we see smite damage is increased by six percent but normal damage taken is increased by six percent as well and then these four talents here I believe we already knew so ultimately my evaluation of the smite talent tree is that it is average assuming there's a cooldown on this talent if there's no cooldown on this talent this talent tree is broken I assume there will be a built-in cooldown to this talent and or it may not work for AoE my suspicion is that this will work for AoE but it will have an internal cooldown of with between one and three seconds that's my best guess for this talent that was not clarified as far as I know so far so we'll just have to test that in game to see how it is but assuming that this does have some sort of reasonable cooldown then I would say that this is similar to the skill tree but a little bit worse and the reason I say it's a little bit worse is because there isn't really like any massive rage regeneration so for example on the support tree we have rejuvenate on the skill tree we have a weaker form of rejuvenate and on the smite tree we do not have rejuvenate we actually kind of have like the anti rejuvenate where you actually reduce the targets rage rather than boost your own I would rather be boosting my own rage and just pop it off as much as possible but there is some value in reducing the targets rage as well so whether you count that as a wash or if you think that's better or if you think that's worse you can let me know in the comment section below but ultimately there was a couple of things that were a little bit underwhelming to me first of all only three percent bonus smite damage is kind of a bummer because while yes you could look at the skill tree and say oh it's identical to tactical mastery you have to keep in mind that there are another two talents that boost skill damage as well so all for one gives you six percent more skill damage to the secondary and then in clarity down here you get six percent more skill damage for six seconds after using an active skill if we pop back over to the smite talent tree you can see over here that there is an analogous smite version of six percent smite damage for six seconds after using smite but there is no six percent bonus smite damage for the secondary commander so i think in that regard it's slightly weaker now that's not to say the talent tree is bad and in fact i think if you are going to run william wallace with liu che you will probably run William Wallace primary every single time every day of the week because this just does have a lot of synergy with smite damage especially the capstone talent here you have a 30 percent chance of increasing your smite damage by 10 percent whereas feral nature in the skill tree is only a 10 percent chance of gaining 100 rage so this will happen three times more often except feral nature is with basic attacks which occur every turn whereas this is 30 percent of the time but only for smite damage so there's just less chances for this to pop down here we have two percent smite damage for every 10 seconds you're in combat I think most likely people will skip this 
honestly i just don't see this being super valuable because you just have to stay in combat all the time if you are really good at playing in dot mode and you can technically like jump from target to target to target and never leave combat then this would be a really good talent to get but you are running the risk of like one misclick and you lose 10 percent smite damage and then you gotta wait another 50 seconds for it to build back up again which kind of sucks and then same thing for this talent up here you get six percent more smite damage dealt but 6% more normal damage taken. And this is the part where I need to just ask the developers, why would you make smite damage scale off of normal damage? If you're then going to put so much emphasis on literally just smite damage, if that was going to be the case, just make it not scale off of normal damage at all and just make it something separate from skill damage and just make it like skill damage 2.0 like i don't understand this distinction they keep doing this and it's so intent it feels intentionally confusing is this a good trade-off i don't think so but maybe like why would you want to take six percent more damage every single turn just for six percent more smite damage on your skill shots uh and also your instant procs i guess maybe it's worth it but if you're swarmed down it's certainly not because you're just going to get even more wrecked right so i don't know overall i would say the smite tree looks really solid but it doesn't look insane right like there are just certain drawbacks that are just like so crazy like no rejuvenate type talent instead of rejuvenate you have an anti-rejuvenate instead of six percent bonus smite damage for a secondary you get six percent less skill damage taken but again overall i think it is solid if you wanted every single talent in the smite tree it would cost you 48 talent points which is the same as the skill tree I think so I mean that that just makes sense that they're just trying to keep it balanced there what that means from a talent perspective though is that you are very limited with what you can do in the infantry tree for example if you grab these talents that I think are kind of non-negotiable then you only have 45 talents left which means you have to skip either this talent or this talent and in that world again if you're great at staying in combat you've mastered the art of playing in dot mode then maybe this is your better choice because it's eventually going to just get you more smite damage in the long run if you're not great at that or you don't want to risk you know losing this to lag or a f frame rate drop i should say then maybe you go for this one or maybe if you don't want to get the downsides of either of those talents you can just skip both of them in general and then you only need 42 talents to get the rest but what are you going to spend those extra talent points on like two percent defense one percent health that's probably not better right so overall the talent build that i would probably recommend for the smite talent tree would be to grab this in the infantry tree you'll have 45 points remaining and in that case you'll come all the way up here and get the capstone five out of five and then you have to decide do you want to grab this talent or this talent right here depending both of them have downsides so it'll be up to you which downside you prefer i will point out though that it definitely sucks that we're not grabbing hold the line i feel like hold the line is super good and in the world where you grab hold the line at all four points you would only have 37 talent points left which means you definitely would not be able to get the cap stone talent here and if that is the case then i think it will only cost 35 talent points to grab this talent and also this talent right here which does get you a lot of value there and then you'll have two points left over so you would put them here and here probably unless this is march speed i guess i don't know my brain is kind of fried looking at this so when william wallace actually comes into the game i will actually build a talent tree in the game because i will be unlocking and expertising him for open field fighting in my current kvk now a lot of you have been asking me when is William Wallace coming into the game and I don't know when I'm going to post this probably tomorrow but I suspect he will be on the next Wheel of Fortune okay so the next time the wheel comes around expect William Wallace to be on there that is my best guess I am very excited to get my hands on him finally and do some testing and actual fighting in KVK to see if he is worth getting if you already have Alexander the Great because he does work really well with Liu Che already it is also worth noting that William Wallace looks like a commander that will only be primary if you're running him with a smite damage secondary as well there's just so much in this talent tree that is exclusive to smite damage like this talent is only for smite this 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 is only for smite like there would just be no reason why you would run William Wallace primary with anything secondary to him that isn't a smite commander right so if you're going to run him with a smite commander like Liu Che for example William Wallace will be primary if you're going to run William Wallace with let's say CPO prime then you would do CPO prime primary William Wallace secondary and that's how that would go in my mind but really I think the star of the show here is William Liu Che that's my I'm putting my money on it that seems to be like what most people will probably do okay next thing I want to talk about here are the new face to face with the developers hot topic Q&A answers okay the first question is I don't understand your plan for adjusting special immigration can you explain it in 
in more detail their answer our plan for adjusting special immigration is as follows after the adjustment special immigration will no longer take up special immigration quota instead it will cost special immigration points at the end of each kvk special immigration points will be issued to kingdoms based on the following rules every kingdom will receive a fixed number of special immigration points okay every kingdom will get some kingdoms will receive extra special immigration points based on the total number of unit deaths of the top 300 governors in the kingdom's lost kingdom death leaderboard rankings and total death only include tier four and above okay once again that is pretty clear the application and approval rules for special immigration will remain unchanged so the way that people apply and get approved will stay successful special immigration will consume special immigration points based on the immigrating governor's power if you fight a ton in kvk and you get a bunch of deads from your top 300 then it looks like more players will be able to get the special immigration into your kingdom at least that's how i'm understanding this i have never used special immigration and i've never been interested in using special immigration and just to be clear every kvk people slide in my dms asking me to migrate i'm i'm not gonna I'm not going to migrate. So just don't like barring some insane catastrophic event. I have no plans on leaving my current kingdom just so you guys know. Okay. Question two, how are you planning on improving the experience for new kingdoms? Answer new kingdoms have always been of great importance to us. And we've always strived to improve their experience. We recently conducted a survey for kingdoms that had just entered sock and most governors complaints focused on one governors immigrating to the kingdom were too strong, making things unfair for native governors. True. New kingdoms were being matched with older kingdoms in KVK resulting in most governors and new kingdoms being unable to keep up big, big, big true. This is a big complaint that I see three. To improve the new kingdom experience we are currently looking at both the immigration and story matchmaking systems and our current plan is as follows so basically what they're saying is hey lots of new players in young kingdoms are complaining that old players are migrating in and they're being matched up against old players which in both cases is unfair because a group of people migrating in can kind of take over the server and also it's no fair and no fun to be matched up against older kingdoms because you're just going to get stomped okay first change extra requirement for cross season immigration to a season two kingdom the immigrating character cannot be more than 120 days older than the target kingdom so that is four months so if your character is more than four months older than a kingdom that you want to go to that is in season two then you will not be able to do that extra requirement for cross season immigration to a season three kingdom the immigrating character cannot be more than 180 days older than the target kingdom so that is six months okay so you have to be within six months of a season three kvk kingdom in order to migrate there and finally extra requirement for same season immigration to a season four kingdoms so this would be the first uh season of conquest that the kingdom goes into the immigration character cannot be more than 240 days older than the target kingdom so that is eight months okay so you have to be within eight months of going to a kingdom that is entering their first season of conquest we will also be adjusting the quotas for the types of immigration listed above in terms of story matchmaking we will be adjusting matchmaking for kingdoms that have just finished season four in their next season of conquest their first time participating in a regular season of conquest these kingdoms will be matched as closely as possible with kingdoms of similar ages okay so they go on to say we hope these changes will allow new kingdoms and their governors much time to grow as possible helping them smoothly transition to regular season of conquest okay my opinion on this is as follows first of all protecting the new player experience is like tier zero it is an s tier priority for the developers okay if you don't protect the new player experience then you have a dying game this is like open and shut case new player experience should be protected at all costs yes that means that you should not be able to migrate back to kvk2 all willy-nilly that is my opinion yes i do agree with this i think that they do need to have some strict requirements in place to protect the new player experience that is no question to me i almost think the new player experience is more important than the end game experience and i know that's a little bit controversial especially if you've been playing for a long time but i've been playing for over five years and i gotta tell you guys yes it is very important for them to add new content for older players that's what keeps us engaged that's what keeps us playing that's what keeps us spending a little bit of money and time and everything that we spend on this game it's not just money it is time as well and so that is important but 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 okay and i talked about this in my video where i said rise of kingdoms wasn't dying what i said was people will always find a reason to quit okay um now there's things that the developers can do to make players quit slower right like by having a fulfilling and fun game that people want to keep coming back to that would keep players of playing but eventually players will always quit a game at some point like life just gets in the way things change interests change 
time changes job changes there's a million reasons why people might quit okay so you're never going to prevent all old players from quitting that's impossible everyone knows this but what you can do is make sure that your new player experience is as good as possible to replace the players that are quitting and hopefully you will get more new players to stay than old players to leave that would be like the golden like position to be in right more new players you get with fewer older players leaving it means that your player base is expanding it is simple math we love this okay and so anything that they do to make the new player experience better and easier and smoother that's amazing we need that it is that is what keeps the game growing and thriving and alive okay so 100 this second part about this though is that players are now going to be mad that they will not be able to migrate to a season two three or four kvk and then you have to ask yourself why why are players doing this it is well known that migrating back to an older kvk will make the progress of your account worse yes you will probably perform better in that kvk than you would in a season of conquest because season of conquest has older players with stronger commanders and better gear and better armaments and there's crystal tech so if you go back to a older kvk kvk two or three or four then you will have a higher probability of performing better in that kvk but any amount of time that you spend not in season of conquest is time that you're spending not getting end game meta okay so it is a you're it's a double-edged sword you, you go back to kvk2 you have have fun for that kvk2 but now you're even farther behind the people that didn't migrate back okay so you like if you can help it you shouldn't have migrated back anyway if i'm being honest with you guys yes i know people want to play kvk2 but if you want a successful end game account you probably don't want to migrate back now it is harder to migrate back than ever so we have to ask ourselves why are players migrating back well the answer is obviously because they like to play kvk2 and 3 and because they don't want to have to deal with the latest meta and they don't want to have to deal with crystal tech and i think crystal tech is the biggest thing the biggest reason why players say they migrate back to older kvks the developers know this okay people have been vocal about this since the minute season of conquest came into the game this has been no there's been no confusion about this nobody is wondering why nobody is like clueless to this everyone knows including the developers everyone knows why people go back to kvk2 it's because crystal tech people don't want to spend on crystal tech and and like i don't blame them it is borrowed power that is what crystal tech is you are spending money or time grinding for borrowed power and borrowed power sucks borrowed power sucks in every game okay it sucks in world of warcraft it sucked in legion it sucked in battle for azeroth and it sucked in shadowlands okay it sucks in every game so this is not a rise of kingdoms problem this is a gaming problem any borrowed power system that i've ever seen sucks okay and that's why part of the reason why crystal tech sucks the other reason why is because a lot of players feel like they have to spend money on it right and you know some players don't spend money on it and they perform pretty well i think that's been pretty clear but that does take a lot of time you have to grind if you're not going to spend money on crystal tech and some players don't want to have to grind every kvk so in a world where we have to protect the new player experience and therefore this conclusion was inevitable okay this was inevitable and you've seen over the years you if you've been paying attention over the years they've slowly made it harder and harder to migrate back to season two and like no like it's no wonder why they're doing that because they're trying to protect the new player experience and that's a good thing and they have to do that but on the flip side they aren't addressing the concerns of the players that like to migrate back to these older kvks right why are they doing it no crystal tech why don't they like crystal tech it's borrowed power also some players might just not have that many expertise commanders and they just want to go back to a kvk where there just are fewer commanders to deal with right okay let's say they can only field two armies well you're gonna have a better time fielding two armies in kvk2 than kvk9 okay so i think this solution only addresses half of of the problem it's trying to solve the new player experience problem which is like an s tier like that is such a high priority that i understand but i hope at some point over the next the, maybe the rest of 2024 in the next six or five or six months hopefully uh they will address the second part of this problem which is players not wanting to deal with crystal tech and or players wanting to just play kvk2 again right like i don't see a reason why they can't just take kvk2 
copy paste in the season of conquest and then maybe there's a cooldown on how often a kingdom can queue for it right like maybe you can only queue for kvk2 once a year and by that i mean like the sock version of kvk2 i don't think anyone in season of conquest should be actually going into kvk2 against a real kvk2 kingdom because that's not fair and they'll get destroyed but if there was a sock version of kvk2 let's say you can only queue for it once a year because there's no crystal tech and let's be honest guys crystal tech makes the developers a lot of money and that is probably a large chunk of how they make their money in the end game okay and so if your solution to this is just remove crystal tech no they're not going to do that okay there's no point in asking the developers to remove crystal tech they're not going to do it okay uh, that is a fantasy that is not real that is just just if that is your if you hope that eventually they'll do that I'm going to save you a lot of heartbreak and just tell you right up front. Okay. Santa's not real. Okay. It ain't going to happen. It just is what it is. Okay. It's been like, it's been in the game for years. They've modified it a little bit and it is here to stay. I don't see, I mean, would I like them to remove crystal tech? Of course, of course I would like to remove it. Okay. Nobody likes borrowed power, but it ain't going anywhere. Okay. I don't see it going anywhere. So if that is your suggestion to the devs, don't bother. They're probably going to throw that suggestion out. I mean, they've heard it a billion times by now. Okay. They've heard it a billion times. That is not a unique or sophisticated answer. They already know they're not going to do it. Okay. So in a world where crystal tech is not going anywhere logically, then maybe we add KVK two in a certain format to season of conquest, but you can only queue for it once a year. That way, players are still forced to play some of the newer season of conquest stories likewise maybe they could do that for season three kvk you can only queue for it once a year there's no crystal tech but you can only do it once a year and that's that and then the rest of the kvks that you do you'll have to uh you know play the other season of conquest or maybe kvk two and three combined can only be played once a year per kingdom who knows that's just my suggestion on trying to like sort of solve the second part of this question which is like there are some players that just want to play this and now you're telling them they can never do it again okay that sucks this is a game mode that is fun players like this game mode right Lilith did a good thing with kvks one two and three okay players like those kvks and so to implement a game mode that players can only play once in their entire career is like well that's kind of pointless right because you're taking a game mode that people love and you're locking it away for the rest of time that's that seems kind of silly right like why would you take a successful thing and then make players not be able to play it that's like I mean like I don't know to me that sounds crazy right like you have something that everyone agrees is good and then you're not letting them play it I would say give them a way to play it I know that you know we have to have crystal tech that's not going anywhere I understand that but maybe it's a limited time game mode a throwback season or something like that every once in a while we get a throwback season and then maybe you let players play it again uh it just it makes the most sense to me I would say let players play it they like to play it we got to give Lilith credit they made great earlier seasons of KVK but they should let us play it more often okay with all of that out of the way and hopefully I didn't piss too many people off with that the guarantee system for drawing armaments needs work even when drawing an armament with a guaranteed special inscription it's still possible that I'll get a special inscription that I already own it makes it very hard to acquire certain special inscription armaments how do you plan on improving the system answer we're sorry that the armament guarantee mechanic hasn't met our governor's expectations based on the feedback we've received in the community we plan on making adjustments to the guaranteed special in inscription system these are the preliminary details of the adjustments first of all the guarantee system for rare inscriptions will remain unchanged every 150 legendary armaments you require for a given formation you're guaranteed to receive an armament for that formation with at least a rare inscription the guarantee system for special armaments will be optimized when you receive a guaranteed special inscription armament rather than the armament type being randomly determined you will be able to choose what armaments type to receive example scroll instrument etc so this is cool so this kind of seems like for gear for example when you forge a piece of gear and you get lucky and you get that special talent just pops up right you get to choose do you want the, the special talent for infantry cavalry archers integration leadership whatever right you get to make that choice and i suspect that with this new update or with the changes that they're going to be making here it seems like when you do finally get that special inscription guarantee it will pop up and you'll have a choice between which of these armaments do you want i think that's a good change once you've acquired a certain number of rare inscription armaments for a single formation you will be able to select an armament type and receive a special inscription armament for that type 
for that formation we will also display the number of rare inscription armaments you've received in a row for a given formation in the armaments interface the count will reset whenever you select a special inscription armament lastly we will be looking at every governor's armament acquisition history and will send compensation sometime after this up optimization is launched the specifics of this compensation are to be determined okay so to me i would like them to be very clear uh should i be opening these right now or not should i be waiting right like i've got formation choice chests should i be waiting for this new sort of pity system to be implemented before i open them as of the time of recording this i will be hoarding these i will not be opening these hopefully they give us some more clarification on that moving forward if you don't need armaments and inscriptions right now very urgently in kvk then i would just hold on to these and wait for this change to come into the game my thoughts on this um are as follows uh well i mean look this is objectively good right this is a good change there's no downside here they're just saying okay what we'll do is we'll let you pick and amazing i love that that's great however i would also like to point out that armaments from the ground up like from the moment they were introduced they were always a slot machine right and for that reason um it's the system in the game that i spend the least amount of money on i i mean i've bought occasional bundles but i would say like it's extremely rare and for the most part i almost never spend money on armaments um and i don't think this is even going to change that to be honest with you like this just doesn't it just seems too random to me uh that's just my honest opinion like I i've said this back back when they implemented the armament system i said that the only way to fix it would be to scrap it and to just start over okay that was my own that was the way i because it's just so fundamentally like unfriendly for the player that i just couldn't see a path forward for them and they are improving it they've improved it many times since i said that but my stances remain un uh, remained unchanged to be honest with you guys um i just i open the formation chest that i get for free from events um you know alliance mobilization maybe i'll get some and yes i do spend in alliance mobilization but i typically don't spend it on formation bundles i'll spend it on something else so i get formation choice chests from spending indirectly and what i mean by that is i don't actually buy the imperium armaments or the royal armaments i i mean i'm sure i've bought them a few times but like it's been months i think like literally months and i've never to my knowledge max purchased one of these bundles like it just they're not good they're just not good so i just don't buy them so yeah i mean at the end of the day uh, we have to admit this is an improvement i'm happy about this the more times i as a player get to choose the better however this is a nice optimization for my least favorite system in the game by quite a bit um so yeah that is my opinion on this that is my feedback on this uh good change still not good system but i mean that we've we've had it in the game for a long time it is what it is we've kind of just grown to live with the armament system at this point their focus on making the new player experience better is very good i'm very happy to see this i think that they can go a step further and add commanders or add something some way to easily transition your progress in the other game into season of conquest so for example back in the day players used to be able to expertise song in the early game and feel really good about that because he was going to be open field meta in the end game that is no longer the case now and there is now a void in the early game for players what should they be investing in there's really nothing that is going to be super super good in the end game isange is still the closest right but he just doesn't really cut it anymore i think a 5511 yugi leong is probably better than a fully expertise isange and that just kind of stinks to know that it's a huge investment here maybe what they could do is make the gen 1 and gen 2 commanders like season 1 and season 2 maybe just make them like cost half as much to expertise or something i really don't know like i don't know the answer here i would say the best thing that i can recommend would be to like put ysg right here or something like that 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 might help new players a little bit or make ysg a leadership commander and then change his second skill to give universal troop attack and then change his museum to be universal troop stats maybe that's an answer right 20 percent universal defense is better than archer defense and then you could put east on with anybody those are a couple of quick suggestions that i have off the top of my head but really um, i'm sure the developers are much smarter than me they can come up with a better solution but as it stands right now new players do not seem to have a good thing to invest in, in the early game that will transition well into the end game of season of conquest and i think that is another component that they should look at fixing for new players but the proposed change here is very good already i'm happy to see that hopefully in the future they will add season two and season three back for season of conquest players 
uh to fight up against other season of conquest players who also miss these kvks that would be best of both worlds guys with that being said if you made it all the way to the end of the, this video you are a real mvp a straight up goat and if you did i hope you'll drop a thumbs up on the video it really helps out the channel a ton to consider subscribing comment down below your thoughts and with that being said guys thank you so much for watching this has been omniarch i will talk to you guys again soon peace